We previously defined the notion of Bayesian estimation, in which we have a prior over the parameters and we continue to maintain a posterior over the parameters as we accumulate new data. What we haven't discussed, though, is how one might use a model in which we have a distribution over the parameters. That is, how do we take such a model and use it to make predictions about new instances? So now let's think about how we use a Dirichlet distribution once we have it. So assume that we have a, a, a model where our parameter theta is distributed Dirichlet with some set of hyperparameters. Now, if we're trying to make a prediction over the value of a variable x that depends on the parameter theta, well, we're just, this is just now a probabilistic inference problem. And so the probability of x is simply the probability of x given theta, marginalized times the prior over theta, marginalizing, in this case, corresponding to an integration over the values of theta. And that gives us this integral over here. So if we plug through the integral, what we're going to get is the following form, and I'm not going to go through the integration by parts that's required to actually show this, but it's really a, a straightforward consequence of the properties of integrals of polynomials. Um, in this case, we have that the probability that x takes a particular value xi um, is, one is 1 over z times the integral over all of the parameters theta of theta i, which is the um, probability given the parameterization theta that x takes the value little xi, times this thing over here, which is the prior. And we multiply the two together, integrate out over the parameter vector theta, which in this case is a k-dimensional parameter vector. And it turns out that when one does that, you end up with alpha i over the sum of all j's alpha j, a quantity typically known as little alpha. And so we end up with a case where um, the prediction over the next instance represents the fraction of the instances that we've seen as represented in the hyperparameters of the Dirichlet where we have x, little xi. So if alpha i represents the number of instances that we've seen where, x, where the variable took the value little xi, the prediction very naturally represents, is, is, is simply the fraction of the instances with that property. And so once again, we see that there is a natural intuition for the hyperparameters as representing a notion of counts. Now let's put these two results together and think about Bayesian prediction as a function of as the number of data instances that we have grows. So here we have a parameter theta which initially was distributed as a Dirichlet with some set of hyperparameters. And let's imagine that we've seen m data instances, x1 up to xm. And now we have the m plus first data instance and we want to make a prediction about that. So the problem that we're trying to solve is now the probability of the m plus first data instance given the m first, the m instances that we've seen previously. And so we can once again plug that into um, a probabilistic inference equation. So this is going to be the probability of the m plus first data instance given um, everything including theta times the probability of theta given x1 up to xm. So we've introduced the variable theta into this probability and we're marginalizing out over the variable theta. Well, one thing that you know, immediately follows is because of the structure of the um, probabilistic graphical model here, we have that xm plus 1 is conditionally independent of all of these previous x's given theta. And so we can um, cancel these from the right-hand side of the conditioning bar, which gives us over here probability of xm plus 1 given theta. 
And over here we have the probability of theta given x1 of the xm. And so now let's think about the blue equation, the blue expression over here, which is just the posterior over theta given d, which are x1 of the xm. And we've already seen what that looks like. That, as we showed just on the previous slide, is simply a Dirichlet whose hyperparameters are alpha 1 plus m1 up to alpha k plus mk. And so now we're making a prediction of a single random variable from a Dirichlet that has a certain set of hyperparameters. And that was the thing we showed on the slide just before that, which is simply the fraction of the, alpha, the, fraction of the hyperparameter corresponding to the outcome xi as a fraction of all of the sum of all of the hyperparameters, where, again, just to introduce notation, alpha is equal to the sum of the alpha i's and m to the sum of the m i's. Now, notice what happens here. This parameter alpha that we just defined, which is the sum over all of the alpha i's that I have, is a parameter known as the equivalent sample size. And it represents the number of, if you, if you will, imaginary samples that I would have seen prior to receiving the new data, um, x1 up to xm. Now look what happens. If we multiply alpha by a constant, so say we double all of our alpha i's, then we have, um, we're going to let the mi's affect our estimate a lot less than for smaller values of alpha. And so the larger the alpha, the more confidence we have in our prior, and the less we let our data move us away from that prior. So let's look at an example of the influence that this might have. So let's um, go back to uh, binomial data or Bernoulli random variable, and let's take the simplest example where our prior is uniform for theta in 0, 1, and we've previously seen that that corresponds to a Dirichlet with hyperparameters 1, 1. So this is our Dirich so this is a general purpose Dirichlet distribution. Um, in this case, the hyperparameters are 1, 1. And let's imagine that we get uh, five data instances of which we have four ones and one zero. And if you actually think about the differences between what the Bayesian estimate gives you for the sixth um, next coin toss relative uh, in, in when doing maximum likelihood estimation versus the Bayesian estimation, for maximum likelihood estimation, we have Four heads, one tail, maximum likelihood estimate is four fifths, so that's going to be the prediction for the sixth instance. The Bayesian prediction, on the other hand, remember, is going to do the hyperparameter alpha 1 plus m1 divided by alpha plus m, which in this case is going to be 1 plus 4 divided by 2 plus 5, and that's going to give us 5 over 7. So let's look more qualitatively at the effect of these predictions um, on a next instance after seeing a certain amount of data. And for the moment, we're going to assume that the ratio between the number of ones and the number of zeros is fixed, so that we have one, one for every four zeros. And um, that's the data that we're getting. And now let's see what happens as a function of the sample size. So as we get more and more data, all of which satisfy this uh, particular ratio. So here we're playing around with um, a different strength, or equivalent sample size. But we're fixing the ratio of alpha 1 to alpha 0 to represent, in this case, the 50% level. So our prior is a uniform prior, but of greater and greater or changing strength. And so this little green line down at the bottom represents a low alpha because we can see that the data get pulls our um, posterior, so sorry, the line is drawing the posterior over um, 
on the parameter, or rather equivalently, the prediction of the next data instance um, over time. And you can see that here alpha is low, and that means that even for a fairly small amount of data, um, say 20 data points, we're already very close to the data estimate. On the other hand, this um, bluish line over here, um, we can see that the alpha is high, and that means it takes more time for the data to pull us to the empirical uh, fraction of heads versus tails. Now let's look at varying the other parameter. We're going to now fix the equivalent sample size, and we're going to just start out with different priors, and we can see that now we get pulled down to the 0 0.2 value that we see in the, in the empirical data, um, and the further away from it we start, the, it takes us a little bit longer to actually get pulled down to the data estimate, but in all cases, we eventually get convergence to the value in the actual data set. From, an, from a pragmatic perspective, um, it turns out that Bayesian estimates provide us with a smoothness where the random fluctuations in the data don't, um, don't cause quite as much uh, random jumping around as they do, for example, in maximum likelihood estimates. So if what we have here is the actual value of the coin toss at different points in the process, you can see that the blue line, this light blue line, that corresponds to maximum likelihood estimation, basically bops around a fair amount, especially in the low data regime, whereas the, um, whereas the ones that use a prior, the estimates that use a prior, are considerably smoother and less subject to random noise. In summary, Bayesian prediction combines um, two types of, you might call them, sufficient statistics. There is the sufficient statistics from the real data, but there is also sufficient statistics um, from the imaginary samples um, that contribute to the Dirichlet distribution, these alpha hyperparameters. And the Bayesian prediction effectively makes the um, prediction about the new data instance by combining both of these. Now, as the amount of data increases, that is at the asymptotic limit of many data instances, the term that corresponds to the real data samples is going to dominate, and therefore the prior is going to become vanishingly small in terms of the contribution that it makes. So at the limit, the Bayesian prediction is the same as maximum likelihood estimation. But initially, in the early stages of estimation, before we have a lot of data, the, um, the priors actually make a fairly significant difference. Um, and we've seen that the Dirichlet hyperparameters basically determine both our prior beliefs initially before we have a lot of data, as well as the strength of these beliefs, that is how long it takes for the data to outweigh the prior and move us towards what we see in the empirical distribution. But importantly, even as we've seen here in the very simple examples, and as we'll see later on when we talk about learning of Bayesian networks, it turns out that this Bayesian learning paradigm is considerably more robust in the sparse data regime in terms of its uh, generalization ability.